Today, we're getting under the hood with Dr. Umbarine Nehal, a daughter, sister, friend, women's advocate, MD, MPH, an MIT Sloan Fellow MBA candidate, a former Medicaid medical director, and a former chief medical officer for a $100 million 14 center health agency in New York City. She is currently the CEO and founder of a digital health company, Her Herd, incubated at MIT, utilizing generative AI and natural language processing to center individual women's needs with a data-driven, personalized, women-specific health journey. This venture was recognized as hot AI startup in Boston for the Generative AI World Conference in 2023. Dr. Nehal was the clinical lead for $1.8 billion in new funding for Medicaid reform to design value-based care with integration of mental health and social determinants of health. She was a co-chair for the PCORI Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute Advisory Panel on Healthcare Delivery and Disparities Research for oversight of more than $300 million in research grants. Dr. Nehal served as an elected district representative and board member to the American Academy of Pediatrics, Massachusetts chapter. She was recognized by President Obama for a grassroots healthcare enrollment campaign for the White House and has advised federal and state agencies. Educated at Aga Khan University, Baylor College of Medicine, and Harvard School of Public Health, she has been named a top voice four times by LinkedIn and has over 220,000 followers. Dr. Nehal is published in the area of business models for AI and healthcare, value-based care, mental health integration, refugee health, and medical education for patient-centered care. She comes from a family of strong, empowered matriarchs and women's health advocates who serve as her inspiration. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Nehal. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I, I know I'm just really um, inspired by you as well on this platform that you've created for women. It's just really what we need. Part of when I, you know, her, heard is a play on words. It can be heard like being heard by the system or your herd of like elephants, which are a matriarchal, you know, family structure. So that kind of speaks to sort of like the ancestors, so to speak, as in, as this is talked about in communities of color, and that we should celebrate women who are aging in a good way. Wow, that's so much, so much um, wonderful, meaty stuff there to unpack. A colleague of mine just sent an article about the African elephants and the wisdom and sisterhood that they yeah. actually create. So thank you for for like just knowing that and bringing that up and also like just basing your company on that. Season three is about women making the world healthier. And I couldn't be more excited to be getting under the hood with you and sort of talking about your journey. If it's okay, can we get going? Yeah, absolutely. I would love that. Awesome. So I ask everybody this question, and I think it's a great starting point to go on this journey together, which is what mm -hmm. was the reflection point, that moment in time that really you know, incited you to go into healthcare or inspired you? Some of my earliest memories are that we would use our, we would be surgeons and our dolls would be our patients because my great aunt, you know, in the 1950s in Pakistan, uh, OBGYN, uh, a surgeon, physician, um, you know, community leader, and she, she built her own hospital and clinic and employed male doctors. And in my family, so I actually, you know, we had a pre-conversation where we realized we're pretty similar. I wanted to be a film major at, at Wellesley and I was not getting straight A's. And so my dad was like, you can, you know, you can do that later, but you're going to med school in Pakistan. <laughs> so it was the default in my family, which has been interesting because there's a lot of like assumptions about women of color or Muslim women and a lot of saviorism towards us um, about sort of like, oh, your, your, your difficult parents must have forced you X, Y, Z. And it's like, I think I ended up in a pretty good place. So were my parents sometimes a little bit, a little kind of close uh, on in terms of guiding me, so to speak? Yes. But I, I think I ended up in a good spot. In a weird way, it was like the default. If you don't have a plan, this is your plan. You become a doctor. So talk a little bit about those early years getting into it. I mean, clearly you have thrived. You have been flourishing in so many different ways in the healthcare space. But like, talk about your journey to getting to where you are today through med school and stuff. 
Thank you. So, you know, we also talked about this a little bit. I don't have any kind of label or diagnosis. I think the system doesn't have the data on people like me, which is, again, goes back to her herd. We just need better data. There's actually a term called GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. And in, in tech, where if you feed garbage to AI, you're just going to get garbage output. So, you know, I don't have a label of any kind of kind, but I think I'm on the neurodiversity spectrum in some way. I don't think there's anybody who would tell you, we talked about this before, like I'm not the median mode. I'm, I'm kind of an outlier. And so even though it looks like I've been flourishing, I can tell you there has been a lot of struggle. And sometimes the people who seem, quote, successful and are outliers are actually encountering barrier after barrier, problem after problem. Literally, there are times where I felt like I was just running running from like this wrong, you know, ass assumption or whatever, you, you know, I'm curious, I'm collaborative, all the like slogans on the wall that they, you know, you, if you actually live it, turns out the system's kind of designed for mediocrity and for just kind of like not sticking your neck out and not, you know, not going the extra mile. Unfortunately, that's some, we, they teach this sometimes in business school, you you're more likely to get fired for making the wrong decision than being promoted for making the right decision. So really a lot of like the pivots in my career have been when I've reached the limit of what that system will allow me to do. I naively believe the slogans. I start to encounter negativity. I move on to the next, the next, you know, whatever. And at this point, I've like essentially in some ways like left the system because I'm just like, I don't, I'm, I'm too. Um, I just feel so blocked, you know, in systems that I'm just like, well, I'm just going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to disrupt from the outside. I think that's really interesting. So, you know, talking about the systems, were you feeling that at the young age or like sort of when you graduated and got literally into the system? So I think that what I would say is that I probably did encounter it as a child. But if you um, and and I think the thing is that I had a mom who uh, was in her PhD program, even she actually did, dis I, the sad part is by being an immigrant to the United States and losing the family support and her herd, so to speak, she did not complete her PhD because, you know, like I think anybody who's a mom can relate, it's hard, right? The United States is not like Sweden or Norway and Denmark that gives all the support to women or like family leave. So she made a choice. She was perfectionist. She did everything well. She was a planner where three girls spaced ex almost the months, four years apart. And so she, I think I had a highly educated mom who spoke the Queen's English, who gave, you know, who came, who was a, a doctor's daughter. So she was used to being valid in spaces from in her home country. And if any teacher tried to mislabel me, she showed up. She didn't, she didn't, you know, yell or scream or threaten she just very calmly understood the rules and just pointed out how things were and she was a very humble woman who dressed very humbly very down to earth many 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 people misjudged her as you know xyz but if you paused and you listened you could not help but respect her and so I'm very, I, I think my mom, and then, you know, my dad had, you know, chose to have a stable, you know, job and provide for us. And he had the ability to do so. I'm very privileged in terms of the um, security that my parents created around me. I also went to an all girls school that didn't have a GPA. Don't compete against each other. Identify your own potential and compete against yourself. And so it was hard going into the workplace. And, and you know, I was, but I, I have, you know, I, I joke that on the, inst I saw a TikTok about like, you know, cultivate your inner like Wall Street bro and name him Chad and Chad walks in the room. And I'm like, I don't need to have a Chad. I already feel valid in spaces. Um, you know, my middle name is Sultana. It means queen. Like, I mean, I don't, I like to think that I'm, I'm not like a diva, but I'm just like, well, where else would I be? Of course I belong here. I think back to you, I think it's really interesting, this fierceness and, and to go into the system here, you were, if you, you say you don't label yourself, but you say you think you're on the spectrum of neurodivergent. Well, neurodivergent in a system is, is sort of like, it's sort of like a, a square peg in a round hole. It's just, you, you know, you, you have to sort of, sometimes those experiences are what get you to be the entrepreneur that you are today. I question, so I want to ask a little bit um, and probe on that. When you were mm -hmm. in your medical director, 
in, in New York City. And, you know, that was a, a big, you know, good size, 14 centers. Were you, would you say you were an entrepreneur? Like as you're bringing in and looking at it, or did you, you know, because you're very entrepreneurial and think differently? I mean, without going into anything that's like, you know, privileged information, I would say that that was an eye opener. I left a Harvard faculty appointment to take on a chief medical officer role, and it was a big jump. I naively did not understand the differences between Boston academia, even Boston federally qualified health center in New York City. You know, New York is very diverse. Every borough, not just every borough, every like neighborhood has its own like culture. Literally the buildings, like one building was an old fire station. Uh, things that are completely out of the control of like the institution that where I was, like a manhole uh, like explodes outside on the street. And now that becomes my job as a chief medical officer. They do not teach you these things in med school. Like, what do you do when you live in a city that has old infrastructure and, you know, you now have to, like, figure out patients have been waiting for months for an appointment or weeks or whatever it is have to be rescheduled. So I came with these big Harvard ideas, um, thinking I was going to like serve, you know, communities of color in New York City, do with these like grand entrepreneurial things. And then reality hit me square in the face about, you know, what I'm no longer in like my little princess role in Boston. This is like, you know, this is New York City, right? So you have to be New York tough. I had, to, it, it was very, a very needed humbling experience about um, the realities of operating um, in even just infrastructure things in New York City. I wanted to be the entrepreneur, intrapreneur. I got some stuff done. I, I definitely had to adjust my expectations. Can you share a little bit about your time at Harvard? And, you know, I know that you that you did public health there. And then like, what was that sort of, because I think I went right to New York City and I missed that to your job at New York City, but it was more to really address that entrepreneur side of you. So how was that experience as well? Yeah, so I mean, I think just to, uh, to kind of link the two, I definitely do think my experience in that agency in New York City is why I'm an entrepreneur now. And I, even with like really amazing people who had the best of intentions, realizing how difficult it was um, and all the compliance. And because, you know, because I think I realized that my mom protected me and my, both my parents did, I feel very strongly about protecting people. I feel very strongly about providing resources. So I'm not, I don't resent compliance. I think it's extremely important, but when my job is so heavily compliance, then I cannot be creative. It's just, there's only so much energy and time. So at, for Harvard, I was, you know, teaching a, a number of things. I also was at UMass Med School where I created a health policy elective, uh, helping public health and med students actually go into like Department of Public Health and get real world experience. I'm all about real world experience. Um, connecting the academic to the outcomes experienced by real people. You know, I was just literally like in Tennessee giving a keynote at 10 Tech and I got to like drive around and it was like real people, right? Like you're just seeing like reality that you don't see at Harvard. And, you know, I come from an academic family and I really examine some of like the same things that give me strength in my identity. I really examine like, why do people get resentful of privilege? And what are the things that both allow me to feel valid in the room, but potentially could be barriers to my truly connecting with the most humble person? So, you know, I was teaching a variety of things. A lot of it was clinical work. Um, a lot of it was teaching, you know, physical exam. Um, but what I did encounter was that as I was trying to not just teach in the classroom, but bring it to the bedside, there's a lot of silos in healthcare. The good thing is we have a lot of teamwork. The bad thing is that each entity, each um, provider type has siloed education, has siloed conferences. And so when I would be like literally reading off the uh, Department of Public Health guidelines on social determinants of health, like barriers to access to food and transport, other provider types were not familiar with what I was talking about. I actually got reported to my boss as, quote, too political and making people uncomfortable at work when I was literally just reading off of guidelines. But it was because unfortunately not enough academics bring it to the bedside. It was just not like common in that space. 
And so again, I just constantly find this disconnect, the posters on the wall, the lovely email sent out by the C-suite, and I've been C-suite myself, and what's actually happening at the bedside, total disconnect. And if you are a neurodivergent person who is more focused on like, you know, focus on possibility, you're seeing what doesn't exist, you're like naively just thinking, oh, the words on the wall mean something, you constantly run into problems in the system. I very much value my education at Harvard. It is not a rural clinic in Tennessee. Yeah, and, and even, you know, to for you to go from Harvard to New York City to, into that environment where you have 14, and to your point, looking at that role as not just a clinical role, but really mm -hmm. over community role in a way, you know? So, so what was that? Did you feel overwhelmed? Were you excited? Were you like, what was the mindset? Because you are a person to tackle problems, clearly what all that you've accomplished. Were you excited about it? Were you like, oh God? Uh, you know, I think I, I, I've worked in emergency medicine. I like intensity. Um, I, I honestly, so the interesting thing is in prior roles, I was prone to migraines. And I think part of what I, I part of it was the stress. Like there's, there was an article that came out recently about when women self silence, it causes us to have more inflammation and chronic illness. So my, yeah, yeah. So when, wow. yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, a, wow. Yeah. Okay. So that's another reason for her heard, right. But not, it shouldn't be that we must use our voices um, because we're not listened to, we're gaslit. I don't love the term gaslit lighting in medicine because in the movie, it's an intentional driving somebody crazy by a criminal and doctors are not criminals who are trying to drive you crazy. It's just that our own training has failed us. Therefore we fail patients. And I don't use that term failure lightly. Um, actually, I'll just a quick kind of aside. My own mom actually passed of COVID where the vaccine was not available in her zip code in Texas. And she had mobility issues and she was a dignified person who wasn't going to show up in some, oh, there's an open vial an hour away. Go and like, like a fish market, go like compete with everybody and push and shove to get a, no, she followed the rules, right? And so she again like she taught me how and i realized like speaking to equity i realized how i've been so called quote the model minority trying so hard to follow the rules that i have not and i haven't thought about sometimes where where the rules fail people where the rules cause harm and yet another reason why i'm now independent but um to your point really about sort of was it exciting yes i mean essentially i was not getting migraines in new york city because i wasn't self silencing i was just like i was you know in every other system i was like you know i was like an employee i was a medical director only i wasn't the c the c suite so i was kind of like well if i if i do say something wrong if i do something wrong i might harm somebody it might go on my hr record but you know, one thing, and this is something that I, a lot of women need to hear, is that like, I you do kind of need to cultivate that inner Chad, so to speak, right? Where you understand power. Uh, there's uh, there's a professor at Stanford who talks about power. Women need to be comfortable wielding power, and going into a space being like, I'm valid here. You hired me. You gave me this title. I have things that I'm going to say that may be uncomfortable. Um, but how do we get to the right endpoint? And how do we negotiate? I'm not asking for permission. I'm not even asking for forgiveness. I will say the reason why I'm doing my MBA is that energy, sometimes the way I expressed it, was probably not ideal in a in a business communication sense. And I, um, you know, have come from an advocacy background where you get rewarded for using a lot of words. And frankly, sometimes what ad advocates don't have power, that's why they're out there with signs jumping up and down. Sometimes they embarrass people so that they will just give you what you want to make you go away. And that's different from being valid in a room, having something uncomfortable to say and negotiating from a position of power. I think that's amazing. I mean, on so many levels, like it's resonating with me. And I think having your women having our voices and what women are like 80, 80% um, 
the carriers of autoimmune disease. So that, because a lot of it's related to stress. So if you're silencing yourself in your, your, that you're taking on that burden, if you will. So self-silencing, I think is interesting, but I think what's interesting about your story is you grew up as this good girl, if you will, good girl doing everything appropriate to what your society, your culture, your world said, this is how you show up. Gazing is to watch over, even when I read your intro, as you progressed in the system and out of the system was each stage you found more and more your voice. I mean, your company is a literally sort of like under the sisterhood for me as a representation of you, right? It is for, about me, but I think also I was born in the, in the United States. I went to an all girls school. I was going to protest when I was a teen, right? And what I saw was that my mom and, you know, like, the most, like, if you look at the tech um, CEOs who are completely, you know, getting our most private information and selling it, like, I just went through security and then, like, they were like, oh, now we're not doing the eyes, we're doing the facial recognition. I'm like, how are my data going to be sold and used? I, do, I, mean, I just need to get through to my flight and I'm going to give permission, but now I have no idea how my data are going to be used, right? Is this going to be used to police me or somebody else in a negative way? going to affect somebody I'm related to, because when I give permission about my face and my DNA, I'm giving permission to my whole family, right? But I just need to get my flight. But yeah, I mean, I think that I, it's, honestly, like I, my mom was very private. And so I don't talk about her that much. And even what I do talk about, some of my family members are like, hmm, would mom really want that? But I, it's really for people like my mom right? The introverts who are dignified and, you know, the tech CEOs, they like literally will build, they'll buy properties around them and tear down houses just to have their privacy. They're selling our data. They're protecting their privacy. So you want to know who is the most privileged, see who has privacy. And so what I'd like to do, it's a, it's a heavy lift. I don't know. I mean, this is why, you know, hopefully in the, you know, venture capital will fund me because if it's a, obviously anybody can do it, that's not something that's going to get funding. You get funded to do something hard. Um, and so the hard thing I like to do is that, you know, women were not included in clinical trials until 1993. Eight out of 10 drugs withdrawn from market for toxicity are toxic in women. Personally, I experienced side effects. I saw my mom experience side effects. I saw my mom both over-treated and under-treated. And, you know, I saw she was very confident, again, very dignified, never yelled, never, you know, was like the stereotype of the woman. It was, I saw how hard it was for her to be heard. I saw how as her fibromyalgia was like draining her of more energy, affecting her mobility, she was not a quitter. She did not give up. But sometimes it was just easier for her just to like let it go. And it shouldn't be that way, right? So we, we should be able to be heard through the system. So what I'm designing is taking things that are usually in research, patient reported outcome measures, quality of life measures, making it accessible to women through an app under your control, using tech um, you know, to make it accessible to you. So if you prefer to talk into the phone, we can use NLP and convert it into like words. If you prefer, you know, whatever. So trying to really center the woman and bring tech to the woman. And in design thinking, there's something called the extreme user. So we usually design tech for the person with the ability to pay who's most like technologically like savvy. No, we need to reduce the digital divide. We need to take it to indigenous populations, to communities of color, to those who don't have broadband access in rural. I mean, I can't do all of this by myself. That is the intention behind it, to take into account the extreme user who's typically marginalized and left out design for them to the extent that it's feasible to do so, but make it accessible to everybody. So when you when you serve the extreme user, you also serve the average user. And this is what people in who are anti-diversity don't understand. We're not taking anything from you. You will probably actually get a better service because we designed for something that is a little bit harder to do. I think, well, first of all, that's awesome. And congratulations on the work you're doing. That's amazing. I love the way you just described that typically tech's, tech is designed for the, well, I, you didn't use this word, but the early adopter, the people who are tech. Yeah. Hey, I love the fact that you're actually looking at it. You're doing a paradigm shift where you're looking at it as let's go for them. And I don't mean this, the lowest common denominator, people who don't have access, marginalized people who don't have access, which means you have to create something really simple in utility so that, you know, 
Um, but I think, and, and that, it, that it just works in a very, you know, but I think that the notion of going after the, that community globally is so powerful. And from a women's perspective, what I'm learning is just, there's so, you know, back to your comment earlier on living a really privileged life. I, I guess I'm a white woman. I'm, I'm privileged and what have you. Being a woman has had its barriers for me. I've had, I grew yep. up in a very patriarchal household and what have you, but I can't pretend to be a woman of color. I'm not, I am just a white woman, not a woman of color with no, other I gender. But, but I, I hear, I appreciate your acknowledging that. Yeah, I no, no, I think it's, but I think to the point is we were both privileged. You have been entitled, but you have used all of your power, your intellect, your, your purpose to build and affect change in the medical and the healthcare space. So, you know, whether it's healthcare reform, doing the research, the grants, I mean, that's just brilliant. And by the way, can you talk a little bit about that experience? It's, I think the problem solvers will be people who are both privileged and not privileged. And I think that, you know, the way I speak, the way my mom spoke, the way you speak gets us into rooms. I'm a woman of color, but I've got straight hair, right? I'm relatively lighter skinned. So I have an awareness of different, you know, I'm color-ish in some ways. There are certainly people, I mean, I'm not even going to say what's been said to me in certain situations, but suffice it to say, there's been some men um, that I was having a business meeting with were people who were flying to Epstein's Island and just some of the things that they said to me. Yeah, I mean, I think at the same time, my family also experienced being refugees. We don't talk about it because unfortunately, some people will use being a refugee against you. So I was raised to kind of like you take your pain and you turn it into strength and that you are still more privileged than others in your community and you have an obligation to lift yourself up and then others. And I, this is, these are definitely, I, it's hard to say, I would say that they're Eastern values, but I was just in Tennessee and they are very community oriented there. Um, I felt very taken care of. Like my Uber driver was like, be careful. You, you know, they're like, it's like, you know, there's human trafficking here, you know, good. You've got hiking boots on, use them if you need to. Like, I don't feel like a, a Uber driver in Boston or New York would give me that advice. Um, so I don't know. I don't, I would, I like, I tend to think of these as Eastern values, but they're not, they're human values, right? Again, back to the herd. I'd say that because I love humanity and I love stories and I am kind of guilty of like responding to every need, which is important when you're a physician. One of the things I, you know, I remember as an intern, there was like a slight dip in the blood pressure and I didn't respond immediately. And I, I got called on the carpet appropriately. Because, you know, kids' blood pressure, usually that's a very early sign. You have to immediately respond. But then how do you write grants when you have all these mentees? And I haven't had kids, so I like, they're all my kids, right? <laughs> so how do, you, how do you write a grant when you need to go in the zone for like 6 to 12 hours at a time, for days at a time, and, and draw those boundaries, right? And not respond when you know that, unfortunately, the world is failing so many people. And, you know, I, there's a lot of family stories about people who went from like riches to rags and then work their way up rung by rung in societies where there's no Medicaid, no Medicare, no anything, right? It, I think the cognitive load, I, and, and actually one thing I would say is that while we think of early adopter, the reason I think, one reason I don't use early adopter is I think we're not designing for the people at the margins and then they don't adopt because it's not given to them or offered to them. No, I I actually um, agree with that. That was just a remark based on your- Oh, the for people. sure. Hey, for I sure. use early adopters who are more tech savvy. They have the money, they have the means, but I think you're absolutely right. When we can make the early adopter people get, you know, marginalized people, the early adopter becomes everybody because it, it's a, and, and, you know, you're filling an unmet need. That's interesting. Well, and from a business perspective, this, this is where the value of, uh, you know, business school comes. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll acknowledge, I kind of felt like because I kept, as I got more confident and more outspoken, my time in each job got shorter. And I was like, oh, people are going to judge me on this. And so part of it is I, I did B school partly, I think partly because I was starting to get sick and I didn't really know what was going on. And I kind of landed myself in a space where I could fall apart. I ended up needing like a surgery, six blood transfusions. I got adhesions. It was my third pelvic surgery. And I, I'd done egg freezing. I dropped a whole lot. They extracted eggs and a whole lot of money. Identified things like endometriosis that I'd probably had for 15 years undiagnosed. And I'd just been powering through 
uh, fibroids, premature impending ovarian failure. Lovely word there. You know, my ovaries are failing. Um, so, I, but then they, the, so you know, the IVF people or egg freezing are separate from your primary care. So they just throw you back like a, a fish into the river, and it's like nobody takes care of you. And so I actually feel like the 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 woman who needs to work three jobs, take three buses to go come clean your house, and the woman who's juggling grants and this and that. We're similar in terms of how much cognitive load we have. The difference is that I can like, you know, when I go to Tennessee and I need to rent a car and I'm driving on a street and unfamiliar and I'm late for two hours, my flight was delayed. And then I was going round and round in the airport because I couldn't find like the whatever people. And they're just like, oh, but she's smart. She's just this brilliant person who's got like who has like, you know, whatever. And she just can't follow directions. Because, you know, but whereas a woman who's a Latina woman who's working in your home, if she shows up two hours late and you needed to go to give a talk, you are not going to be as kind to her. Right. So that the kindness that we show to people is diff- that's where I think privilege comes in. I think that that yes, yes. And I think that's mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, it's a very yes. And I'm not sure how to unpack this one. I'm like sitting here. Hmm. I, Elizabeth, I love the fact that you're, you're so open about that. And that is, I think we need more of that. I think that we, as, as those of us in these intellectual spaces, being willing to like, say like, that is, there's a lot there. Let yeah. me, let me wonder. Let me pause. Exactly. Well, and, and it's interesting because I'm listening and I'm just like, what is the right way to approach that? Because it's such a delicate conversation. And I, and I, and I, you know, so I, I'm smart enough to know what I don't know. And then smart enough to say, hey, I'm not even comfortable talking about that because it's like a, it's a, it's a minefield. And yet when you're living it, like you've been living it, I haven't been living it the same way as you've been living it. And I do want to address, you know, thank you for sharing and being really vulnerable and sharing your health issues. The one thing I want to address about that, um, Maureen, is here you are, is this amazing healthcare professional. You have all these degrees. You're at MIT now. I mean, all of this stuff, 15 years, you went undiagnosed with Mm endometriosis. How is that even possible that we don't know our bodies that way when we're even, when we're, you know what I'm saying? You're a specialist, you specialize, yeah. in this, but you don't know this. Like, did you not feel that you, that something wasn't right? I mean, I just thought it was normal to on occasion almost pass out. <laughs> I don't know how I made it through med school and residency. I like working a hundred hours a week, pre-work hour restrictions, I, or I don't even know. I think it was just like, you know, both of us come from physician families. The interesting thing is actually for me, I was told that being a doctor is a really good uh, job for a woman because you never have a boss. You don't have anybody who can like, you know, harass you or control you, which was true in for my for my the relatives in Pakistan. But in the U.S. with like, most physicians employed by these behemoth conglomerates. It's opposite. You're just a, you're, you're, I feel no different from like a Amazon worker with a tracker on my ankle, you know, literally they have movement trackers on clinicians and I get it from operations, efficiency, blah, 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 blah. But like at some point we are doing health and human services. There has to be human aspect to it. And again, that's another reason I've like left the system. How do we not know? So if women were not included in clinical trials till 93, we stigmatize menstruation. If we don't talk about it, if, you know, again, we both come from physician families. Physician families are typically kind of leaders in communities. We have to be strong, right? So if my middle name is Sultana or Queen, Sultana, you know, then it's like, as a queen, you always have to have like this like, presence right you can't show so even when you show quote vulnerability it's still very strategic right so i am sharing i'm sharing this after i've processed it when i'm communicating it as part of my story for my startup where i've already figured out the solution and so true vulnerability and i see this in you and i'm not saying this as a criticism but your immediate thing is like well then how do we approach this which is a beautiful, beautiful sentiment and feeling like I want to solve the problem, but we have to get comfortable with uncertainty and periods of time where we're just looking at the problem, feeling distress, 
managing that distress and just going deeper and deeper into understanding the customer, the user, the individual's experience of it, listening before rushing to do and to solve. And it's so hard for us, for those of us who are, you know, come from families that teach us to be leaders. Honestly, Ambarine, your story is like unbelievable. Everything that you've been through and the fact that you continue to have to fight. And what I like about your journey, and a lot of women have said, my journey hasn't been linear. What's interesting about your journey is the way you've pivoted. You you hit a wall in some circumstance. Yeah. About the type of brain you have, this incredibly intelligent problem solving, to your point of potentially neurodivergent, that you go and then you just shift your, you know, you pivot, you pivot, you say, you know what, this is not working. I'm going to go that way and let's try that way. And so the journey, and then you have things like life circumstances, back to the word humanity. Humanity, mm-hmm. interesting word, you know. So what you're doing is touching on missing unmet needs in humanity that need to be filled. But instead of going out and just immediately, hey, here's the solution, methodically seeing, hearing, like what what is the landscape? How do you go out and really provide a solution that is meaningful? And so I think that it sounds like all the work you're doing is just brilliant in doing that and really seeing. And I think that's where we're, as two organizations, we're really aligned. Oh, 100%. Yeah. And I mean, I think that, you know, like I, as I... You know, as I was describing earlier, how I can get grace when I don't do things perfectly, like, you know, like, oh, she's brilliant. Like, you know, and again, like I felt awkward saying that word about myself because, you know, we're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to whatever. But, you know, and it's this really fine line you have to walk where you can you need to be like, you know, um, you know, I I joke that if um, to be the servant leader, but what happens if you walk in the room and people mistake you just for the servant? Right. If um, I the, depending on how I dress or whatever, you know, I could I mean, the, the good the good thing is, is that, you know, there's something called management by walking around. So and my my mentor, Dr. Feigen at Baylor taught me this. He would, you know, show up every morning at 5 a.m. in the ED, see how is it, you know, how it talked to the residents, uh, you know, walk the floors and very like he knew everything that was happening. He knew everybody's name, every parking attendance like name, knew their families. So I did the same in New York. I was always in the centers. As a result, my communication was more by email versus the like, you know, typical executive one-on-one, you know, conversations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, you know, if I st- sat behind the reception desk in the Bronx or, you know, Harlem, I could be mistaken for one of the Latina nursing assistants or receptionists. So it's good and bad. The good part is that people are so comfortable around me. I see what's really happening. They forget who I am. Um, On the other hand, I had people like, you also see how women like that are treated. So, um, you know, there were things that I saw and encountered that other C-suite executives um, were not aware of. And that's really hard, right? So when you're trying, when you have like, you have like relatives who've been, you know, refugees, you have, you know, generational trauma in your body. You see things because, you know, in a certain way, I don't assume everything's against me personally. I intellectualize, I, you know, leave the kind of, I leave the situation and I'm kind of like, they talk about going to the balcony. And, but on the other hand, that's also a trauma response, right? Where you leave your body. So how is it that I didn't know? Like I have a cap- capability of like, probably again, a neurodivergent thing. I hyper focus and I just don't feel things in my body. I've literally had to do mindfulness training to learn to feel things. But then I'm also trying not to become a nervous Nelly where I'm constantly like, is this twin or something? Is that twin or something? Because I obviously can't keep pushing through until I get so sick, nor can I be. And so again, this comes back to her herd. Whether you are cleaning houses across the city or whether you're running around, you know, from meeting to meeting, you just don't have the cognitive space. And so how can we take that off of women's plates? How can we have continuous, like whether it's wearables or patient reported outcome measures, how do we start to populate a better database for women so we have less GIGO or garbage in, garbage out? And then how do we refer better? Again, this is a heavy lift. 
what parts of this I will be able to get funded for and execute on and deliver quality results. If I have to narrow the scope to ensure quality and then grow over years, I would do that, right? I'm not going to just try make these promises. Oh, I'm disrupting everything and be like the equivalent of the bro, right? You know, women have a, or have a struggle to own all of their accomplishments, all of the many things they've done in their lives. And I think that it's really unfortunate that we do that because hearing you describe that, that you, I'm, you're just not sitting comfortably with it. We keep going on. We keep figuring out what, what's next. What are we going to do? Really interesting, hard, interesting. You know, you're seeing it, you know, at, from a leadership perspective, it's, it must've been tricky to sort of walk that line. You know, I think this is where mentorship is so critical. Um, my mentor, Dr. Feigen, did this every single day. And I did the Feigen elective. I literally shadowed him for a month. He went into a board meeting. I went to a board meeting. A faculty promotion meeting. I went to a practice. You know, it's just like I fought, followed him everywhere. He did not require the student on elective with him to sh show up at 5 a.m. like he did. You could show up at 8 a.m. Um, but I, I mean, as a resident, you experienced it. You were finishing your call. You're exhausted. You're overwhelmed. You're thinking about quitting. And there's Dr. Feigen, right? And he's right there. And, he, you know, he was, you know, you like respected him tremendously. You wanted to like, you know, make him proud. But it wasn't, like, it was like, there was like, it was true camaraderie, right? And it was a sense that he's, he's, you know, one of the most important things in, in clinical medicine and design thinking and anything is observation. You just have to be there. It seems like, quote, a waste of time because you could be in a meeting with these fancy, you know, hot shot, fancy pants, whatever. You could be schmoozing to like, you know, grease the skids to get that grant funding. We all know that's how it works. You need to develop relationships. You need to be a known quantity. Are you, quote, wasting your time by spending your time like, just sitting there? in a center, um, not writing a grant, not schmoozing, whatever. But if you don't understand what's going on, how are you going to solve problems? That's exactly like, I can see you sitting there as a leader, as a physician, being one of them, meaning one of the people coming in and feeling the pains in every different capacity, not just from a clinical perspective, but from a human perspective of this is what access looks like or doesn't look like. Yeah. And this is one of the first lessons in design thinking. You need to, you know, they, in, I think in Japanese is go to the Gemba, right? You need to observe. You have to just, um, you know, when I was at uh, practice clinically, um, I would tell med students, first thing you walk in the room, you know, in emergency medicine, first thing, look at the kid. If they're like, going gray, you need to immediately act. The kiddo ain't, you know, about to, you know, go gray in like the next two minutes. Focus on the caregiver because the kid's going to go home with the caregiver. You need to, that's who you need to influence and convince uh, and, and, and learn from, right? It's not just a one-way street. It's true shared decision-making. But while you are talking to the caregiver, the child does not feel your, their, your eyes on them, but you're watching them. Mm. How are they breathing? What's their color? What's the interaction with the caregiver? Do they, is there trust there? Is there some kind of unsafe situation going on at home? which again is a huge part of pediatrics. But then as I myself, you know, was no longer the eager, you know, early career model minority, like, you know, now I was listening to communities of color, particularly black communities, understanding the barriers, you know, a bunch of things. I was like, wait, as a pediatrician, it is my job to report parents and families, but what are my implicit biases? What are my assumptions? Like, who am I policing through the system? And am I wrongly labeling parents? Like, who is, you know, the family separation that's happening through my job? So th there were so many ethical issues that came up as, you know, I started to try to solve problems, hit walls. And I was, and it's sad that you have to experience it before you can under, you know, like, that's the problem with empathy is that if you don't have the lived experience in yourself, your ability to feel empathy for somebody else is really limited. So at Yale, I know you're in Connecticut, um, there's a Paul Bloom talks about replacing empathy with rational compassion. Hmm. So we should, like center on ourselves. Empathy is actually, it's it will offend people to hear this, kind of egotistical. I feel your pain. The subject of that sentence is I. 
And, and by the way, you probably never, unless you, unless you've had Graves disease, you haven't felt my pain <laughs> because you haven't experienced the same thing I've experienced. So in a way, yeah. I've written a lot about empathy. So, and probably wrongly, I go openly and say that. No, not really. Empathy by design. I've looked at it differently. But sure. I is to your point, I think there is ego. I think that's interesting, rational compassion. Hmm. Well, even there, right? Like the experience of Graves disease is going to be unique to each patient. So that's another thing that I'm thinking about when I build her herd is like, how do I, what is, what is the right method? Again, to your point, can't do everything as a startup, must focus, must execute, must be fast and, you know, outcompete the big behemoth systems. But, you know, what is the right way? Is it uh, sourcing information from the internet, from individual patient stories, which pharma does? But then how do you ensure that you're not spreading misinformation? Because any one individual's experience is always 100% valid to the extent that they can be a source of medical advice to somebody else, mm, you have to think about that one. But women do wanna hear from other women. Again, they're heard, right? Um, being heard, hearing people's stories, but um, you know, there's a, a professor who's uh, truly brilliant, you know, many brilliant people in the world, but uh, Linda Griffith at MIT, who founded, co-founded a gyne path lab, gynecology and pathology, just again, start to help us understand our bodies better. Um, she was quoted, I believe, in NPR talking about, it sounds funny, but period privilege. Mm -hmm. Don't have difficult periods, center on themselves, benchmark on their own experience and be like, oh, no big deal. Just like pop a mite all and like go to work, you know? Meanwhile, there are women with like debilitating pain. And the interesting thing is I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm sure some psychologists could spend like a long time, you know, unpacking me. I, my endometriosis was not causing pelvic pain. It was a neurologist off of LinkedIn a year ago who shared with me decades old data that was never shared with me that endometriosis has impacts on your nerves, causes what's called autonomic dysfunction, which causes blood pressure fluctuations and migraines. And we treat endometriosis like a surgical disease. But I mean, migraines, what are you going to do? Do a lobotomy? Like we used to do that on women. Hopefully we don't do that anymore. We, we need better diagnostics. We need better therapeutics. You know, there's some overlap of endometriosis and the ways that autoimmune functions. You know, some people find this like a controversial thing to say, but I saw a tweet on, on Twitter that was like, we should, we have cancer centers. Why don't we have endometriosis centers? Because it affects almost every organ in the body. Interesting. Yeah. And I heard different stories. I actually interviewed um, the filmmaker Shannon Cohn and she, oh, yeah. she did under the belt. But I think what was interesting about her story is it took her over, I don't know if it was 10 years or 13 years. I don't want to get the number wrong. Somewhere between sure. 10 and 13 years to get diagnosed. She, yeah. from a young kid, started having these problems, like a teenager, but yep. she never rigged her life. She was at like a high-end lawyer in you know, big law firm, what have you. And she was Jerry rigging debilitating pain. Back to your point is it's very different for endometriosis. Isn't like a one, it's yes. just every, you know, everybody's different. So I think that's interesting. I'm going to move, move along because, yeah, sure. um, but this has been, this has been an amazing conversation. Do you want to talk a little bit before we close about what your mission is and your vision? Yeah, I mean, so I, I like, you know, I think drawing on so many things that we've already talked about, whether it's rational compassion, being data driven, better data, reducing the Geico, we're moving into an AI, you know, powered world. Um, as a, you know, practicing physician, I've seen how much the system affects my ability to practice the pressures. Um, literally, you know, so, so awareness of all of that, feeding all of these experiences that other women, you know, I've spoken with over 200 women and over 40 clinicians and I'm online all the time, like looking at what people are saying. And I, I like constantly every Uber driver I talk to. So it's really to, to draw all this like collective experience from the herd of men and women, you know, men are very much a part of this or 50% of the population. We're all born of a womb. We're all born of a uterus until we have an artificial womb. So this matters to everybody. And male caregivers are just as critical as women who are experiencing the disease. Women are valid in this space. We need them. So how do we build something that takes women's, uh, that allows women to input their data, be 
describe themselves as they describe themselves, reduce administrative burden on them and on the system for women's like data stories to turn into data that turn into something that the system understands to deliver outcomes so that women can thrive in their lives for quality of life, for being able to have social lives because right, loneliness is a problem um, for people to be able to keep their jobs, thrive at their jobs, um, not be scared and hiding, you know, what's going on with them, but be able to have language and data to communicate, be like, this is a problem. These are the you know solutions that are needed. Let's get to outcomes. Be very pragmatic. The emotional support is equally needed, but it is really about helping women get better results. This is your platform today, Umberine, to give women a message, a women of all ages, of all cultures, of all backgrounds. What do you want to say to them? I would just say that we need to, and I just use just, <laughs> I just need to stop doing, lean into the discomfort. Lean into, you know, we want safe spaces. Personally, as somebody who's like, my own body has not been safe for me, I lean into the discomfort. I use it. And, you know, we all have different types of privilege. Let's we talked about, we all have different types of barriers. Let's not get clickish. Let's not, I, I do think there's, there's value to having your own personal herd, your own group. So both and, to your point, what you said earlier. Have the people around you that support you, that nurture you to fill your cup, have your safe space. Simultaneously, do not get siloed. Lean into the discomfort, keep learning, keep, you know, the algorithms are going to keep dividing us and drive an outrage economy. Fight it. Do not let them do that. Do not let them divide us, right? Our diversity is beautiful. We're not all going to get along. Women are 50% of the population. When people are like, why can't women get along? Why can't men get along? Right? We don't say that. So it's fine to have your safe space. Also keep pushing through the discomfort to, you know, exactly what you're doing under the sisterhood, you know, create that sisterhood, create that community of all genders. Because as you were saying it, I was thinking, yes, sisterhood, we need to unite. We need yes. to unite. And I think that you're saying that I love also that you've been leaning into discomfort. I do want to make one comment to women around the world, including yourself, which is yeah. lean into discomfort intellectually, challenge yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't lean into discomfort when it comes to your body. When it comes mm -hmm. to your body, make sure when something doesn't feel right, you take care, you get to the doctor, you get that support. Because yeah. I think there's a double entendre there that women do lean into discomfort physically. They, yep. We might not always lean into discomfort where we're being challenged intellectually, where we could actually push ourselves to create and do something amazing like what you're doing. You know, and what you just said, I just had a new idea from what you're saying. I mean, because if we had less, if we leaned into less physical discomfort, we would open up more space for the intellectual discomfort and the emotional discomfort. So that's exactly why we have to take care of ourselves so that we have the ability to have other types of discomfort, which are essential to problem solving and community building. Dr. Nehal Umberine, thank you so much for your time thank getting under the hood with me. You are just amazing. And I can't You're wait to see you continue to shine. Thank you. And I thank you for this platform. It's just been, a, it's just, this really fills my cup. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Under the Sisterhood. If you haven't already, please give us a quick rating and review on Apple or Spotify. And make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn so you can hear from more amazing women. This podcast is created and hosted by Under the Sisterhood LLC and Elizabeth Elfenbein, produced by Elizabeth Elfenbein and Matt Butler and edited by Matt Butler. The music is by Ayla Schaefer, her song Rose. 